This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with former U.S. intelligence officers who have great stories to tell. And today, I have a couple of wonderful storytellers. Joining me as my co-host is Ralph Mariani. Ralph is another former uh, CIA colleague. We served together overseas in India many, many years ago. Um, Ralph held a number of positions um, in the agency over the years. And more recently, uh, I'm very pleased to say, um, co-authored um, a wonderful article about our former COS in Athens, Dick Welch, who was uh, assassinated in 1975, that appeared in our scholarly journal, uh, The Intelligencer, about a year ago. Our guest today is Mike Howard. You know, um, many of our CIA colleagues have uh, wonderful and inspiring uh, backgrounds, and Mike certainly um, is one of those number. He's an Army brat, grew up um, at Fort Ord in Northern, Pennsylvania, uh, Northern California for much of his life, started martial arts when he was 14. He actually has a black belt in a kendo, got a uh, degree in criminal justice from San Jose State, joined the Oakland uh, Police Department, and then joined the CIA, where he served for 22, 23 years. And then after retiring from the agency, he went on to be the head of a personal security, and then the VP for global security for Microsoft. Ralph, Mike, welcome to AFIO Now. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Uh, Jim, I'm going to hand it off to you and let you uh, start the conversation. Okay. Before I get started with uh, Mike's, uh, for me, Mike's pseudonym was Knucklehead, and it still remains that. But I want to thank you. You thanked me, but I want to thank you for making... Uh, the Welsh article, uh, a reality, as you know, uh, the impetus for that for years, some of us felt that Mr. Welsh had never been memorialized by some of the media, primarily the Ta New York Times and the Washington Post, and he was ignored. And his nemesis, uh, Philip Agee, was not ignored. And we finally got together, uh, Raleigh Flynn and Samantha Randazzo Childress, and put together the article, but without AFIO as a platform, as a conduit, uh, that article would never have seen the light of day. And I might say, uh, when we're done, I have some, yeah, that article being on the internet, we've heard from some students in Athens, Greece, PhD students who are pro-American, and they found the article, thanks to you and AFIO, and they're anxious to do some more things to highlight Mr. Welsh's loyalty and patriotism to America. So there's an example of the internet and AFIO working together. So thank you for that. I'd like to say it's an honor to co-host and chat with Mike, but the word honor and my relationship with Mike just don't go hand in hand. Mike is a is classical uh, street man. Uh, he, he, I know he reached the hollowed halls of the Microsoft leadership. But for me, Mike will always be a street man. And he showed that in his career. His book, of course, highlights it, um, which he can tell you about the book. But his um, beginnings as a police officer, and he wasn't in Celebration, Florida or Pleasantville, New York. He was in Oakland. And that street sense uh, showed itself to me when he worked for me. I was the deputy chief of station in uh, Manila, and he was with me from 90 to 91, really about a year and a half, because I got there really early. And I'll get into a little bit about Mike and Manila when we reach that point of the story, of his story. But I'd rather uh, start have him start and uh, give some background to his career. But uh, this is not some suit. This is a guy who uh, was able to transition in about three or four different careers during a lifetime, which, of course, he's still living and I'm sure still contributing. Take it away, Mike. Well, thank you. Appreciate it, Jim, and appreciate it, uh, Ralph. And I, I actually, I believe my uh, uh, my pseudonym was Stumblebum, as I remember, uh, from, from Ralph. Uh, I think Stumble, Stumblebum was inside the embassy. Knucklehead was outside the embassy. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And just uh, one clarification: I was an army brat, not an army vet. My dad was career military, 
But yeah, I, uh, I was blessed to have a really wonderful career, three careers, actually, uh, you know, starting off in California, where I was raised as a local police officer. I'd always wanted to be a cop. Um, and then one day when I was on uh, patrol and had break, had a break, uh, I remember picking up a book called Piercing the Reich by Joseph Persico. He was a historian. It was all about the formation of OSS and how uh, they penetrated Nazi Germany. And then, uh, you know, obviously uh, Europe, Nazi occupied Europe. And I thought, wow, this spy stuff, this sounds interesting. And uh, I, you know, I actually went across the Bay Bridge to San Francisco. Agency had a presence there, kind of the Reagan build up years, you know, and uh, they wanted my background. And I actually started off with the Office of Security for the first six years. Uh, doing a number of things. But my last two years, I was with Director Casey's security detail. And as those of you remember, Bill Casey, um, uh, he'd been Reagan's campaign director. Casey made him director of CIA. Uh, I was on his detail for two years. Um, he was a cabinet official all over the world and and uh, figured I was going to be you know, a career officer security person for the rest of my life. One day we were on the seventh floor, I believe it was a weekend, and Saturday, uh, the DO at the time, Claire George, shooting the bull with us, as a lot of folks up there did. And he said, hey, you guys, uh, you ever hear this CTC? No. I said, we're, we're, they're, they're forming up this counterterrorism center. And uh, it's being run by Dewey Claridge. I said, wow. And he said, you know, they could probably use guys with your backgrounds, because most of us were law enforcement, a couple former N NIS, now NCIS agents. We were all part of uh, Director Casey's detail, actually ended up going to speak to Bill Servanak. Uh, I think a lot of people know Bill. Unfortunately, he passed away not too long ago. Bill's a legend to, and a, a mentor to a lot of us. I, I wrote a book called uh, The Art of Ronin Leadership, recently a, a, a leadership book, and I, I spent some time talking about Bill, his influence on me as a leader and on uh, probably a whole generation of us. But we were encouraged to talk to Bill. Uh, Bill had a unit within CTC, uh, Protective Security Branch, which was there to train foreign dignitary details in the things that we were doing, Casey, right? Protective uh, operations. But obviously, the main bread and butter was to spot assess and develop possible, you know, uh, recruits in our class that, that we thought were going to have potential in the future. Uh, as assets for the local station. And he liked our cut, I guess, and we liked, we certainly loved his cut. And uh, I remember we made the jump uh, to, you know, I guess the dark side to the, to the DO. And uh, I, I remember finally our first day with uh, coming in and, and the op center there at CTC and there was Dewey and he said, Hey, you're Casey's boys. You guys made it over. Right. And, uh, Hence started uh, my DO career and uh, spent two years doing that particular assignment and then went to the Philippine desk as a desk officer for a year, uh, prepping for a PCS assignment to Manila. I mean, prior to that, obviously, my life was all TDYs. I did a lot of work in West Africa, did a lot of work in Asia, uh, worked with a lot of different presidential details and training them and hopefully getting some good assessments uh, for the local stations. But then, yeah, I went to spend a year uh, on the desk and then was assigned to, to the Philippines, you know, two, three years there. And we can get back to, uh, to that, Ralph, because I know there was some things you want to ask me about that. I'm just giving kind of a broad snapshot of my career in the agency. And then... Um, from there, I came back and I became Bill's deputy uh, with the, the FD Snapshots counter surveillance team. Uh, and they, they had a significant impact on my career and my life, uh, starting with the Philippines. And it was kind of my first foray into official leadership. And from there, I took a diversion uh, to another part of, uh, of the organization. I, I went to the career development staff, right? mostly personnel, and I did career development uh, training as well as starting up a mentoring program within the DO. And then from there, I actually went to uh, Office of Military Affairs as their first executive officer and helped 
Tom Cilio, who had been a career NR officer, to set that up between the military and the agency, and that, that taught me some more skills. Went on to the IG. I was an investigator for the IG on the investigation staff for a while. Then came back to the to the DO to what they called uh, back at CTC. I was always you know career CTC, um, and went to work what they call other world branch. So that was all the non-Islamic terrorist groups like the. Red Army faction and the PKK and those kind of things. And then, you know, I, I eventually uh, became uh, chief of station in Pittsburgh. And that was my last assignment. So I decided to take an NR assignment. And uh, I was there on 9-11 when the plane went down to Shanksville. So we worked a lot with the FBI, kind of worked that case. And then I eventually made the decision to go into the private sector and go to Microsoft. So that was kind of my, my, my career in a nutshell. And we can kind of and peel the layers as, you know, Ralph uh, delves a little bit more into my career. Okay, uh, maybe before you get into the details of Microsoft, uh, I'll go backwards uh, to your comments about CTC and um, the tumultuous period in the mid-80s, which was historic in many ways, uh, many heartbreaking ways also. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the leadership that you pointed out, Dewey, Dewey uh, Claridge and Claire George, uh, both coming from the same division as Jim and Ralph, uh, were magnetic personalities uh, that made things happen. And I think something needs – Bill Servanak has been eulogized uh, in many ways, but he really was a very special guy. And I can only imagine – I never worked directly for him. But I in, involved. I was participated with things that he was doing, and had visits with him when I'd go back to headquarters. And you just knew that if he was involved in the snapshots, stand, standing up the snapshots, that things would work. I remember his also uh, Fred Turco was sort of mm. above about, above Bill, and the, all that those combinations made uh, really made things happen and. I'm sure that CTC is still as relevant as ever, if not more, after 9-11. But um, I want to, uh, uh, you know, as you and, you and I met for the first time, and I recall, in early, in early 1990. Uh, 90, I, yeah. yeah, I went out to Manila from, the, from Williamsburg uh, to sort of code, as a code DCOS, and it was... A lot of people probably don't know this, and I want you to get into it. And that is the threat that the New People's Army, a Maoist group, small and focused mainly on the Philippines, the havoc that they cause, uh, the killing of uh, Nick Rowe, the killings of others. And for about a year and a half, two years, uh, they were really, really treacherous. So. Could you give a few comments about being the security officer and going up against a group like the New People's Army? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I was on the desk when Nick Rowe was killed, and uh, I remember getting a call in the middle of the night from Ken Daigler, who was our branch chief at the time, saying, hey, Nick Rowe had been assassinated. And that was like two or three months before I landed in the Philippines in 1989. And I remember you could you could cut the fear in the embassy uh, and even the station with a knife because not only had Nick Rowe been killed, but uh, they were killing the NPA. That's the uh, so that's New People's Army, as Ralph said. Um, uh, that was the armed wing of the Communist Party of the Philippines. Uh, they had assassination units called Sparrow units. They were quick. They were deadly. Well trained. Uh, planned their operations very well, and they were killing uh, our, our 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 colleagues in the Philippine military intelligence uh, and police left and right. And then besides that, I was, we had two major military bases at the time: Subic uh, Naval Base in um, Clark Air Force Base, and they were targeting airmen and, and sailors who were frequenting the bars and the establishments uh, outside restaurants outside of base, typically coming up behind them and shooting in the back of the head. And so because of my, my background, when I got to the Philippines, the then 
COS Ted Grohl. He came in before Billy Lofkin. Uh, Ted, you know, could you partner with the RSO's office and kind of look at the overall security for the station? Because we didn't have a station security officer. So I kind of was wearing two hats. I was part of liaison branch, working with liaison. But I was also, as a declared officer, but also kind of working with the, the RSO's office to kind of get a beat on uh, on security and, and, and things like that. After, you know, kind of assessing the situation, it was, it was pretty obvious that we needed security for COS, DCOS, right? And we needed to figure out some methodology uh, for, for how to tackle, tackle this problem. So one of the things uh, that I worked on first was I always believe that no man fights alone, right? Especially when we're under one flag. So I needed to pull in not just the RSO's office, but we pulled in uh, the league at the league at that, that was working the Nick Rowe case, FBI. And then we had a huge NIS, now NCIS presence. And I partnered very well with the, the chief there, um, special agent in charge, uh, Steve Eitzel, who uh, you remember Steve, I think, very well. Th- he had a big presence in Manila. They had a huge presence, obviously, at Subic. So we partnered with them, Air Force OSI. We kind of uh, put together, you know, kind of a working group task force, kind of looking at holistically at what we needed to do from a from a security standpoint. For you know, for CIA, one of the things that I finally decided upon was we needed some counter surveillance capabilities. Right, we needed to stop playing defense and we needed to start playing some offense. We knew that they were surveilling choke points from the suburbs, uh, Dos Marinas, Makati, all these places where expats and diplomatic personnel uh, uh, were living to the embassy. There were several, there were only several ways to get to the embassy at the time. Uh, I can't speak for Manila now, it's been years. And they were very good, we knew from Intel, in, like I said, taking their time to look at, uh, like they did with Nick Rowe, patterns, movements and possible places for ambush. At some point, I, I raised the issue, uh, bringing the snapshots into, into Manila. And Bill, by that time, was running the snapshot team. And I remember when they deployed, probably the first 12 guys that showed up. And they kind of had a dual responsibility. Counter surveillance certainly was the bread and butter and trying to map out choke points uh, areas where we believed people could set up for ambushes, but they were quasi protective detail too. You know, we were all armed, and uh, we uh, they would do you know follow cars on COS, DCOS, and obviously work a lot with the the RSO's office. We set up a safe house in uh, in a part of the city. We set up an OP across the street. Uh, there was a hotel, I remember. We got protests every Friday, I remember. I roughly remember from the f- people who wanted us out of the Philippines. So SNAP would set up an OP and just kind of get a beat on any regular characters, you know, that might look suspicious um, at, at that time. So that was kind of the, the, the impetus. And then uh, I took a lot of trips to Subic to work with the NCIS folks there. Uh, like I said, I partnered very well with Einzel and we got to the point where we started working with OSI, and NIS. It was, you know, it's interagency. And we would, the places where we thought, you know, the bad guys would ostensibly set up, we would actually take counter surveillance vehicles and we would, we'd mix up the days uh, to make sure that they, they would, maybe they'd see a, a presence of some, Westerners coming through, looking around, right, on a Tuesday. We wouldn't be back till Thursday. So we're keeping them off balance because they would never know who's around. And obviously working with the local police constabulary, the local NICA, who is our partner, you know, our partners in uh, in crime, the, the their intelligence service. And so that was kind of what the snapshots were all about at the at, at the very beginning. We also were able to, and I was very proud of this, able to recruit an asset who had been working with former hitmen, you know, the Sparrow units. 
And they had this returnee program where ostensibly the Philippine government was going to rehabilitate these folks who had been hitmen, but they didn't have the resources. They didn't have the, uh, the infrastructure to do that properly. But, you know, we were able to make a recruitment of a certain individual and actually be able to use these former returnees to be on the streets to spot and assess whether they see their colleagues and whether, you know, again, other choke, but other places that maybe we as, as Westerners might miss. And so it was, it was a concerted effort uh, and the SNAPs were an integral part of that as well. I firmly believe that, well, after, after Nick Grove, no Americans were assassinated, at least in Manila. And I think we, dra- we dramatically, we, we, we took the same model and we presented it to the NCIS folks at Subic. And so they started following that too with counter surveillance. And we would have SNAPs just be talk to them as well and show them how to set up so they could go to outside of Alangapo and, 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 and Subic Bay and all this kind of stuff, kind of do the same things. But yeah, those were interesting, interesting times. And I remember the mood and the tenor, like I said, was very fear based at the beginning. Once we had a plan together, once we had the right people at the table sharing intel, sharing information, sharing techniques, and then going out collectively, and then obviously working with our counterparts in the Philippine government. And you see the, the tide turned. But these guys were deadly. We, I remember Steve Eitzel, uh, NIS was able to get hold of a video that, that showed uh, the NPAs in training. And they had, a, they had a technique where they would carry a 45 in their belt. And as they were approaching their, their subject, they would pop the, uh, uh, the barrel of their weapon right into their hands, be able to sh- shoot and put it right back in a nanosecond. That's how fast these guys were. Well-trained. And so that, 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 that was our opposition at the time. Mike, uh, a couple of things I want to, one, the slight correction. I think your chronology, I think Bill Lofgren preceded rather than succeeded Ted Grohl. I mention that because, and I'm not sure if both of them, from your perspective, uh, set up that. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah. I, were both of them? Uh, I think both were on board because I I overlapped both of. I mean, I overlapped Bill as deputy. Right. Yeah, and the reason why that's important is uh, it it says a lot about Lofgren and Grohl that they would allow this apparatus, this new sort of project to take place without, and I can't emphasize this enough, without micromanaging you. Mm -hmm. If you, and I think this goes back to your being a street man, especially Lofgren and and Ted too, both of whom, by the way, are still with us. uh, And I'm in touch with both of them. They, They realized, and I encouraged them because they didn't spend the time with you that I did, that there's no... We didn't have to bother with you, and the, because a lot of chiefs would possibly take a look at this and say, "Whoa, this can go wrong," and the ambassador this, and you know, it's a big embassy. Manila was a big right. embassy, and Nick Platt was the ambassador at the time, a real seasoned ambassador, and he had a lot of trust in uh, Bill. That's for sure. They had served before together, uh, so I wanted to throw that in there. Uh, the key being the uh, two COSs. I have to say, with some other security officer or other who come across as a, a bureaucrat, I don't know that it would have worked like it did. Now, as far as liaison, Jim, of course, is master at it with in the many countries where he's been the boss. And liaison with the local government services, of course, is crucial. But one thing that I saw there was the interagency, inter-embassy liaison that you had, and you've mentioned it already. But I want to say something about, and especially this, Jim, I'm sure you would, you could just imagine the problems that could come up between the diplomatic security people, i.e. the the RSO, and a guy like Mike Howard, who's a cop from the security officer from the agency. It never happened. 
And let me tell you, the RSO, that was one of the toughest RSO positions in the world. And he had a bunch of ARSOs. His name was uh, Pat O'Hanlon. I don't know if Pat was a heavy set, tell it like it is, here it comes, guys, from the Bronx, New York cop. And if you remember the show Kojak, well, Pat O'Hanlon would make Kojak look like Bugs Bunny. He was one tough guy and didn't take anything from anybody. And he worked with Mike Howard hand in hand, even though Howard was from our security. And Steve Einsel, you I know you must have said his name five or six times, but I think it needs to be said again. Uh, again, you have this unusual liaison relationship in the embassy between NIS, which was what it was called at the time, and our station having a full-time, thank God we had a full-time security officer, Jim. We couldn't have done it without a full-time security officer. And thank God it was it was somebody like Mike. So that interagency thing can't be minimized. Uh, I know we take it for granted. Of course, we all work together. No. When there's a stressful situation like there was, and let me tell you personally, I it was stressful. When you're reading intel reports that say that the number two guy in the embassy in the station is a target and the number one guy in the station, thank God they didn't use my name. They probably would have spelt it wrong. But, <laughs> you know, by title, yeah, that's uh, that's that's stress. And when you have a driver like I did, Primo, and um, boy, was the driver for uh, Ted, mm -hmm. the techniques that they use would make you stressful. Sometimes I just lay down in the back seat and my little pistol next to me. But anyway, <laughs> I really want to emphasize the interagency liaison function that you served. I can't say enough about it. Uh, I remember Pat O'Hanlon was famous for his Halloween party. Boy, you were, you, I remember you being there and you were like one of them. And that's not very often that an agency officer is that welcomed by the RSO teams and the diplomatic security. Yeah, I spent I spent half my time in the RSO's office between Pat O'Hanlon and then at another time, Phil Jorland, who was also one yeah. of the RSOs there. They they had we had the right people, the right personalities there who were willing to share information. They weren't parochial and uh, this is my turf, right? And it was it was an interesting time. It was all the stars, I think, aligned to to make sure that we could we could tackle this problem collectively. It was a time that was certainly stress filled, but we had the right people at the right time to to to, to take it to the bad guys. Yeah, and again, uh I want to, I'm repeating myself, but I think it's worthy. The fact that uh, Bill and Ted allowed you because they could see you didn't need any freaking help. And, uh, you know, just status reports a couple of times a week and they were satisfied. That's crucial. That allowed you to allow you to do your job. And another example of leadership. I think that's all I wanted to say. I, I, I think it's worth mentioning to those. But, you know, the New People's Army is not as well-known historically as Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, Hamas, others. But what happened was the New People's Army basically fizzled out because of a natural disaster. And that was Mount, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in June yeah. of 1991. Just as 91. You were getting ready to leave, Mount Pinatubo took place and it and about two weeks before it took place, uh, Richard Armitage, the envoy uh, who was doing the negotiating with the Philippine Foreign Ministry on the bases, which, of course, is the big issue for NPA. They wanted us out of the bases. That was it. They were yeah. one, issue, one, issue, one issue terrorist group. Armitage made an offer to the Filipinos uh, about two weeks before Pinotubo erupted. And the Filipinos figuring they could bluff the United States into a better nego get more money if they turned the offer down, turned it down. And sure enough, two weeks later, Mount Pinatubo hit and covered, repeat, covered Clark Air Force Base in you know what? Uh, ashes. It destroyed the base. And after that, the United States, I'm sure with a 
smile, a glean in their eyes, uh, Armitage said, you know what? You can have it. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. ironically, ironically, that was the death knell of the NPA. And thank goodness. Uh, but for that two year period, it was hell on wheels. OK, yeah. I'll, let you, I'll let you go into your uh, entry into Microsoft. It must have been a big, big decision for you and a tough one to make. Uh, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say. I'm sure Jim is, too. Sure, sure. And, and one point I want to make before we move on to that, you mentioned GRS earlier. Uh, at some point, a big part of that decision, I believe, and, I, you know, you were, you were part of it. We decided that the, the snaps were effective, but they shouldn't be a protective detail, right? That really is not their bread and butter. And so we brought in actually a good, great, great friend of mine, Scott Kafer, who was also CTC at the time, brought him and another guy in to actually kind of do an assessment. And after that, the upshot of that was security brought in their first team in there to do actual security. Now, they would actually follow me like to Clark Air Force Base. Anybody could avail themselves of those services if they wanted to. And that became eventually that was kind of the nucleus of what people now know it as GRS. It's very there it was very small at the time. They didn't even call themselves that. It was just a security team out there to uh to do some work. But that was the first kind of foray into that. And now of course it's uh it, it's 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 huge in the agency. So yeah, getting back to me, I I was I was chief in Pittsburgh. I had been offered I put in for two onward assignments. There was uh, DCOS Manila, and then they were opening up Wellington, New Zealand. As, uh, so I put in for for chief there. Yeah, you know, they I kind of was offered both, and I said, well, I've already been to the Philippines, and so I was going to be chief. One fine day in Pittsburgh, you get a call from PEMS officer, and you know, you get kind of get the humana, 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 right? So, uh, hey, Mike, you know, um, you know, an assignment to Wellington, yeah. You don't have it anymore. Uh, so, and because someone who knew uh, the then deal at the time was coming out of the war zone, kind of wanted that assignment, and that assignment was kind of taken away. And, you know, politics, we've all gone through it before in the agency. And so and I was talking to my then wife, um, Karen, uh, who had retired uh, 25 years CIA. She'd been an OSO, career OSO. And we kind of talked it through and said, you know, like, you know, I don't feel like going back to D.C. Been there, done that, you know, and uh, decided, you know what? And and I think the other driver was both of our uh, moms were still alive. Hers in Southern Cal, mine in Northern Cal, getting older and not always in the best of health. Kind of decided, you know, I've kind of run out my string on things that I really wanted to do. Had a great agency career, loved it. But let's explore the private sector. So left left the agency and the first thing i did upon leaving was reach out to einzel because einzel had left nis years before that went to work for kroll you know the uh you know sort of corporate private investigation group and then started his own company so i just reached out to him he said look i'm going to introduce you to a headhunter i didn't know what a headhunter was i'm a government guy right and guys named jerry brennan he's a great friend of, of ours to this day and he said hey look i've got uh, Steve told me about your background. You know, I had, I did whatever I had to do with the central cover with, uh, with my resume. And, but Steve vouches for you. So there are like two things that I have. One is in Southern Cal, which I, to this day, I can't even remember. I see the other one is uh, running security for Bill Gates at Microsoft. You know, they need a head of executive protection. Um, and he said, but I'm not being hired to staff the job. They want to do it internally. So you're going to have to make up a story. Uh, I said, I work for the agency. That's all I do is make up stories, you know, so I can you know, come up with some BS way of figuring out how I found out about the job, right? So I did, called the number, and lo and behold, they, uh, they after submitting my resume, they, they brought me in for uh, an interview. I interviewed with a whole slew of people, a bunch of VPs and folks in Bill's office, and then uh, ultimately they called me back uh, this was, oh gosh, uh, this would have been summer of 2002. They brought me back in uh, to Redmond, Washington, outside of Seattle, where Microsoft's headquarters was. And I had a one-on-one -on -one with Gates for 45 minutes. 
and I'd studied everything I could about him. And it was a fascinating 45 minutes. He was, he's laser focused. He was looking for someone that could, you know, run protection for him without basically getting in his way. And that, that was basically it. Uh, the, the, the HR folks at the time had told me, well, you're in contention with some other folks from the Secret Service. I found out later that wasn't true, that Bill had discounted the Secret Service folks because they all came in with, you know, their book full of, I was, this is me with President so-and-so. He didn't care about that, right? I described to him how we could do low-key protection, not get in his face, but we'd be around. I was used to that with Casey. Right. Casey would watch you around when he watch you around. A lot of times he didn't want to see you. And then we could hide in the woodwork. But if he needed us, we'd, we'd be there. And so I got hired by uh, by Bill. And I spent the first year kind of his, his team was broken. Uh, I spent the first year kind of putting that team together, giving them a sense of purpose um, and instilling confidence in Bill in, in the or, in the organization. I mean, literally, this is a true story, guys. But one of my first trips with Bill was actually here in Las Vegas to a, a big show called Comdex. It's now called CES, a uh, big, big technology show. Bill was always keynote. And we were staying at the MGM Grand. There were these mansions behind there where he would stay, where high rollers would stay. So we finished up his speech one evening. So he goes back to his room and his strap hangers, you know, the PR internal comms folks said, hey, Bill may want to take a walk around the you know, casino, stretch his legs. But we'll let you know in about five or ten minutes. Five ten minutes comes out. They and we've got we've got I think we've got some legal folks there. We've got PR other folks. The the, the one of the PR folks. Yeah, he's coming out. He'll be out in five minutes. Well, guys, I was with. They literally hid. Like one guy was behind a bush. Another guy went away. And I'm looking around. And Bill came and did his thing. So I asked him, "What gives?" He says, "Well, he really doesn't want to see security." And I said, "That's BS, right?" I mean, you got you know legal there. You got. PR there, you got all these folks there. You have just as much right to be there. That was kind of the, the atmosphere uh, there. So part, a big part of it was to get get my team to understand their role. They don't have to be afraid of Bill got mad or, or his team got mad. That was my job to take the hits. My job was to protect my team, but also instill and build a sense of confidence that we could do the job, which I, well, we did. He actually sent me a note when he left uh, Microsoft to work full-time in the foundation, but basically, thanks for showing me you can uh, do security without really sort of getting getting in the way, and that was that was nice. And then, as it happens in the private sector, a year later, promoted to the chief security officer. So I ran all physical security globally for the company. Over a period of time, we built that into a world-class security organization. When I took over, it was very U.S.-centric. If there were investigations to be done in overseas, we'd send investigators from the U.S., which was dumb, right? I remember because my agency background tells me you need boots on the ground in the field with area knowledge to do that kind of work. Uh, at that time, I had only 19 direct reports. We eventually grew our organization to probably 60 direct reports and a few thousand contractors globally. Uh, we ended up building three operation centers, uh, one in India, one in China, one in the U.S. that had state-of-the-art technology that could we could track every Microsoft employee. We could message anybody uh, instantly if, if the balloon went up. We were responsible, and a lot of people don't really know what a corporate security group does. They think we're just the, you take care of the, uh, the, the, the man guarding the guard force. That, that's part of it. But any kidnap and ransom issue that came about with our employees, we dealt with. Any bombings that went off or any place in the world, we're multinational. We're responsible for making sure our people are safe. And in some cases, we had to evacuate people out of harm's way. We had our own intel analysis team uh, to do uh, analysis on threats against the company, our own investigations team, threats of violence uh, against our employees. We had our own technology team, huge technology team that did R&D on Future technologies is also keeping the trains running. We had 22,000 cameras globally uh, in all of our facilities. Microsoft itself is 300,000 employees, right? I mean, it's huge. And we had obviously uh, executive protection. We had our own contracting team, education and awareness. So it runs the whole gamut. And so, uh, you know, the idea of for those 16 years, we built a world-class entity that people would come benchmark with, not just my peers, but 
we work with our government affairs people, and they, we brought in uh, a lot of folks from the USG. Uh, we had the president of Croatia benchmark with us, uh, Iraqi ambassador to the UN. We had a lot of heavy hitters that came to benchmark our technology and the way we approached security. Uh, we were actually able to turn our organization, which is a cost center, right? Essentially, we, we don't make money for the company. We turned it into a virtual profit center. We were able to bring money into the company by partnering with our marketing folks. Along the way, I, I eventually joined two organizations, uh, security organizations, became president of both of them at one point. So I was running two boards and um, then doing a lot of work with State Department with OSAC, uh, partnering with OSAC to exchange information. And I was on one of the OSAC councils. And uh, so, yeah, I had a, I had a really great great career. It was, I never thought my, from the agency, my career would go into this direction. Obviously a lot of the things always leads with the local, with the chiefs of station, right. As well as with FBI secret service and all the other organizations as, uh, as CEO, uh, CEO, um, CSO, I kept my clearances through DOD. So I, I had my TS in case you need to talk classified. Uh, we had we had a presence at the FBI at, at, at one of their uh, kind of op centers uh, to, to share information. So there was a lot of things that that translated from CIA to the corporate sector. There were some that didn't. Um, I had to learn to be a business person first and, and understand business speak. And remember that unlike the agency, it wasn't all about command and control. It was about influence, sometimes without authority. And uh, that was that was a new one. For me, but I, you know, I eventually learned it. Um, so that that was kind of the that was kind of the story. I don't know if you want me to fill in some some gaps, for Ralph, about the uh, Microsoft days, but that that was kind of in, that in a nutshell. I do have a couple of vignettes that I know you're aware that you, of Mike Howard vignettes yeah. that I want to ask you about. I understand that when you were protecting him, Mr. Casey, you had a not an incident, but a unfavorable development at a country club in uh, is it West Palm Beach where he had to take some action when you were being hassled. Oh yes, could you repeat that? Was that okay? To- yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't me, but it came it came about just before I went on the detail. There was a gentleman by the name of Clay Holmes, a black agent. Casey had two homes. He had uh, one in Long Island and he had um, a home in in West Palm Beach, Florida. And so we'd take him to both. And he used to play at the Breakers, which was, you know, a real famous golf course. And uh, Casey loved to play golf. We got a kick out of watching him play golf. Actually, we'd follow him on the golf course and, you know, he'd shake one and we'd go sometimes grab the ball and throw it back on the course. But that's neither here nor there. Well, the guys told me this. So, you know, Casey finished his round of golf. He goes with his uh, partners and, you know, the country club agents went in with him. And apparently somebody on the staff saw Clay and said, well, you know, asked him to leave. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're government agents. And, we're, and, 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 you know, this is 19, this is like 1980, early 80s. And so it's hard to believe that that was happening. But Casey got wind of it. I think he abruptly paid his check and, and said, we're leaving. And he never said, we're never coming back here. And he never came back to the breakers. And I was a stand-up guy to do that. Casey was, uh, he could be a crotchety old guy and, uh, you know, always didn't have the best table manners. But the guy cared about the DO. He cared about the agency and obviously cared about, uh, stood up for for things like this that were, uh, were right. And I always... I always admired that when I when I heard that story about him. That's the kind of metal and that's the kind of person he was. Okay. Um, one last thing uh, to say about you and I, when we talked about liaison with the inner aid, you know, the embassy, I might add that um, naturally, like any large station, we had characters in there, and and I must say that if I had to pick someone who was and you, I'm not sure if you were, were you assigned a liaison or you were assigned to admin with security? I'm not sure. Can you recall? No, because I, I, I no, because I had left security and, and joined the DO. So I was a DO officer 
Okay. Uh, so I was we, we is on branch, you know, first with Rob McCall and then, as you know, with Dave Knowlton when he ran it and then Rick, Rick Prado, who was the deputy liaison. Yeah, I remember you most with Prado. I think you guys uh, shared the uh, Ronin uh, label. I mean, I'm not sure how that all started, but um, I know he also was a martial arts guy. So the two of you, I made sure made friends with both of you guys. You know, that was it was easy. <laughs> Rick being from uh, Miami, by the way, he has a um, his own book coming out to compete with yours. I think it's coming out in about a month. Black Ops. Uh, yeah, I'm different. looking forward to reading it. This it yeah. should be fascinating. Anyway, uh, Jim, from my perspective, you can see I'm a big fan of Mr. Howard's and uh, I have to come up with some new nicknames for him. Maybe the Maestro. Uh, that no, was no, 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 no. Yeah, no. no but, it, it wouldn't be the, it wouldn't be the same, Ralph. If I didn't hear those words, like I, like it, it, I could go back in time to walking the halls at the embassy or the station, saying, "Morphil, you stumble bum, get in here," you know. And yeah. then I knew the world is right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, but you know, truly, uh, that it goes back to the street sense thing that I first thing I said about you. And because our agency is, uh, if you don't have street sense, may as well hang it up. And you really needed it, and you did a great job your whole career. I'll turn it over to Jim. Appreciate it, boss. Well, as promised, a couple of great storytellers with some wonderful stories to tell. I want to thank my good friends, uh, Ralph Mariani and Mike Howard, for um, this session. I know our uh, viewers are going to really enjoy it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate the opportunity, guys. This is fun. Thank you.